When the Tejas design was first leaked to the press, the Indian public immediately started the process of making sense of its configuration. The aerodynamics is obviously what draws the attention right out of the gate, because it is, well, visible to everyone. Why the wing has a double delta platform? Is it maybe connected with the Saab Vigan in any way? Conspiracy! Why there are no canards? And no strakes? Why those air intakes? In this video, we try giving some answers. Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. Please stay with me till the end, because the stuff that we discuss here is not easily found anywhere else on YouTube. Mind, in this video there will be quite more interpretation than usual, because the only people who know for sure why a specific configuration has been chosen are the designer. We, as usual, try applying some common knowledge to what we see and what we know. The Tejas is 13.7 meters long. The Gripen A is 14.1, the Gripen E is 15.1, the Rafale is 15.7, and the Eurofiber is a tad short of 16 meters. So the first relevant point is that the Tejas is the shortest among the modern deltas. And since the size of engines, pilots and the undercarriage is roughly the same for every plane, uh, the very fact that they need to be accommodated inside the fuselage, it will require a stubbier, a less elongated fuselage. This in itself is the harbinger of a higher aerodynamic drag, if compared with others. Actually, Rafale and Eurofighter are quite stubby because they have twin engines, but the Gripen, which has a single engine like the Tejas, looks more elongated, particularly in the most recent versions. The Tejas tail cone also seems less defined and shorter than the Gripen, probably contributing to a higher drag as well. There is a video about the Gripen in which we explain why having a good elongated tail cone is actually positive for the drag. I am adding the link somewhere here, if you're interested you can watch that video too. Observing the Tejas fuselage from below, it seems that the area rule was not adhered very strictly. Uh, the fuselage section seems to become smaller towards the tail, but it is difficult to discern the typical area rule curve. This actually seems a rather common problem with the Tejas. The preliminary studies for the version Mark II, for example, demonstrated that changing the way the canopy bulges, it is possible to achieve a significant drag reduction. Always in the context of the Mark II, adding a section of less than a meter behind the cockpit where the departure from the area rule is higher will further contribute to the drag reduction. So, Mark II aside, the extra drag seems to be the reason why, despite the fact that the Volvo RM12 and the F404 IN20 have the same thrust, despite the fact that the Gripen is a bit heavier, the Gripen is capable of supercruising, and the Tejas is not. For the same reason, it is to be expected that the acceleration in the transonic region to be penalized if compared with the Gripen. It is difficult to say why the aerodynamic was not optimized for the best performances. I suspect that simply there was not enough room to accommodate the internals, and the result was a bulkier fuselage than the ideal. However, the ADA seems to have learned a lesson if we have to believe to the preliminary information about the Mark II. Another area where a compromise had a direct effect on the performance was the air intakes. The Tejas uses very simple air intakes that would not look out of place on a plane from the 60s. The reason for this was the understandable choice of keeping the design simple, light and cheap. Unfortunately, in the original project, they were designed for the cavalry and the installation of the F404 
required an auxiliary intake to be opened on the side of the conduit. And to be honest, this choice is not uncommon, both Gripen and Rafal have fixed intakes and they work well. The problem with this type of intakes is the high drag generated at transonic and supersonic speed. That is, in the portion of the flight envelope where, as we have already seen, the plane has already drag problems. It seems that with the Mark II a classic mobile shock cone may be introduced. If this happens, it will really look a lot like a mirage. The Tejas wing is a never-ending source of discussions because it looks special. Some very particular interpretation can be found on the internet, in forums, and I personally witnessed discussions among the aviation fans that tend to be quite creative. But actually, there is no mystery. Actually, it is a quite classic Delta Wing with a few peculiarities, but let's start from the beginning. But before starting, for those who are interested, there are a few videos dedicated to the subject of the Delta Wing, uh, but Let's just have a brief summary. In the early 50s, Delta Wings became very popular because of their excellent transonic and supersonic performance, combined with good maneuverability and good structural properties. However, the problem was that the aerodynamic center of the wing moved around quite a lot. At the design speed and flight condition, all was hunky-dory, but at different speed, a lot of trim was required and the trim drag cancelled a lot of the aerodynamic advantages. The, the plane tend to be not versatile, it could be optimized for speed, but not much else. So for a while, the Delta Wing was abandoned. The introduction of relaxed stability and fly-by-wire changed this perspective. Now it was possible to position the aerodynamic center and the center of gravity very close to each other and not worrying too much about the aerodynamic center moving in unstable territory. The computer could compensate all of that. The Tejas and all the modern deltas are designed to be intrinsically unstable, but not too much because at transonic and low supersonic speed, if the aerodynamic center and the center of gravity of the plane are close, the plane can fly with minimal trim and the drag generated is minimal, way lower than a traditional configuration, even an unstable one. In other words, the combination Delta Plus Canard has a performance sweet spot that is exactly where we need it to be, at transonic speed and at low supersonic speed. So it's not surprising at all that the Tejas were designed with a proportionally large and frankly, very harmonious delta wing. What was surprising was the absence of canards. Yes, because all the design from the 80s onwards do feature canards or four planes. The reason of their popularity is that they greatly improve the maneuverability and the flow above the wing, improving the aerodynamic characteristics of the delta wing. And the benefit is huge. The combination Delta Plus Canard has a performance sweet spot exactly where we want it to be, a transonic and low supersonic speed. So I believe that there are two reasons behind the absence of canards. One has been discussed on the press by official Indian Air Forces uh, sources. It was believed that the control laws and the fly-by-wire could be sophisticated enough to make the canards not necessary. If the canards were not necessary, then it was weight, complexity, cost, and a little drag that could be spared. Unfortunately, it was not the case. In fact, the Teja still has problems in opening the full flight envelope in respect to the practically usable angle of attacks and the European Delta Canards, in general, can reach higher angle of attacks while maneuvering. This means that the noose pointing capability in combat may be lagging behind these machines. 
The other less subtle reason is that the plane is small because it needed to be light and cheap and there is physically no room to position any cross coupled canards above the wing. And the plane is also short, so any other type of canard, for example, not close coupled, well, can be excluded a priori. So look at this picture of the plane being assembled. There is literally no room to attach the canard actuators to a strong structural element. Anyhow, the problem has been acknowledged and the Tejas Mark II will be longer and with room for canards. The Tejas Delta Wing has a double sweep angle. This is an unusual feature and all sorts of theories have been built around it. The most creative ones are those which see a connection with the sub Vigan, a plane that had a similar feature. Well, I am sorry, there is no connection and the resemblance is just superficial. The Vigan was a stable plane with the center of gravity ahead of the aerodynamic center. In this configuration, the four planes must lift at any time to keep the plane level. On the contrary, in modern deltas, the canard are used for maneuvering, but they do not necessarily generate lift at all times. So, if the canards lift like on the Vigan, they also produce a downwash on the wing directly behind, reducing the local angle of attack of that section of the wing. And if the angle of attack is reduced, the wing section produces less lift or, in extreme cases, a downward lift. So it becomes basically useless. The problem was so severe that the Saab designers wanted to reduce the sweep of the inner part of the wing to zero, just saving surface and weight. But they couldn't do it because of some nasty shockwave interaction at transonic and supersonic speed. What they did was to radically change the airfoil and the twist of the inner section of the wing just to squeeze some lift from it. If you're wondering why they used such a large canard, it was because the short takeoff and landing requisite was so strict that they needed it to help with the rotation at takeoff. Now we know that the Vigan has no part in Tej's wing design. So, why the wing is like this? I'm sure that you know that the peculiarity of the delta wing is to generate lift by generating a system of vortices, even at moderate angle of attack. Again, there is a video going into the details if you are interested. The position where these vortices originate tend to be toward the root of the wing, but in general, the detachment point moves along the leading edge. The change in sweep is used to fix the position of the vortex generation and to avoid the vortex moving too far forward. This was desirable in the case of the Tejas because the plane is so short and to avoid changing the stability conditions too much, the designers wanted to prevent the aerodynamic center from traveling too far forward, which would have happened if the vortices had moved too much forward. So, what seems a landmark feature is not a sophisticated refinement to squeeze more performance, but a simple solution and effective solution to control the aerodynamic center movement. Actually, it also has the effect of increasing the wing area without changing the wingspan and the root chord, which can be beneficial for lift generation and, again, maneuverability. What is hardly noticed though, but is probably much more relevant to determine the performances, is the shaping of the airfoil and the various twists of the wing itself. In the slow sweep area, the leading edge is lifted up to avoid interfering with the air intakes. Outboard, it seems to be twisted in an irregular manner. Also, the dihedral, which is negative, changes with the wingspan. It is very difficult to give an interpretation of these features, but it seems that there was a great optimization job behind the design, no less complex or maybe even more of what can be found on other Delta canards. 
So if you like this video, I am sure you will like the videos that are going to appear beside me. In the meanwhile, please like, dislike, subscribe and hit the bell so you won't miss anything. And if you could support the channel on Subscribestar or on Patreon, that would be amazing. In the meanwhile, thank you very much for watching, stay safe and see you next time.